up wonders of London fans it's me Vincent and have you guys been on our witches walking tour we are of course a walking tour company and we have many tours around London and one of the tours is our witches walking tour and today I'm going to be taking you on a mini version of that tour and giving you some extra stories that we don't talk about on the tour to prepare you for when you visit the tour and one of the places that we walk past is actually this wonderful church which is all hallows by the tower as we prepare for halloween you will see many mythical things coming up all over the place but the church of all hallows by the tower can be found within the city of london where you can find these mythical beasts dragons within the city how brilliant is that there are a few switch stories associated with the beautiful church of all hallows by the tower but one amazing thing about the church is if you ever visit it, go inside because you will find a beautiful 3d map of roman london and this is where we begin our tour with the romans who invaded 2000 years ago things to discover within all hollows by the tower you must certainly visit this church and one of the things you definitely must visit is this wonderful 3d map of roman london and that's what london looked like almost 2000 years ago when the romans invaded with the bridge now known as london bridge very beautiful church. Now, when the Romans invaded 2,000 years ago, they built what we call today Londinium. And your closest station to where I am is Tower Hill Station, which also happens to be the meeting point for the Witches Tour. Um, and of course, Londinium, which we call today the City of London, was about two, a square mile. Uh, it's close to two square miles now, depending on which maps you consult. But it is quite a fascinating place. Uh, and in fact, this tour is a look at the propaganda surrounding witchcraft and how women came to be accused as, as witches. And yes, you had many men accused of witchcraft as well. But you find more women were accused of witchcraft than men. And what we do on the tour is try to figure out why that happened. And it is mostly propaganda. And as I mentioned, 2,000 years ago, the Romans invaded and they created a lot of the propaganda that we know today. Now, many people will attribute the image we have of witches today, particularly in our cinema and stories to Shakespeare. This is the image of the old ugly hag, the old ugly crone, uh, an old despicable woman who sadly often has disabilities. And in fact, um, Anne uh, Hathaway actually got in a bit of trouble in her recent witches movie um, because of the way they depicted witches in that particular story. And of course, lots of people will think this comes from Macbeth by Shakespeare, where we have the three sisters, the three weird sisters, the three witches in Macbeth. But in fact, in literature and art, we have the saying, good artists, good writers create great artists steal and Shakespeare knew of this and in fact he borrowed from those who came before him particularly the Romans Shakespeare was very well read and he perhaps had read, uh, read pieces uh, on two witches called Canidia and Sagana and these pieces had been written by the same person Horace a Roman philosopher and he wrote two pieces on Canidia and Sagana one was a comedic farce and the other was a much more sinister piece. The first story is a comedic farce and it's being narrated to us by a statue, much like this Roman statue of the Emperor Trajan. And in fact, in this comedic farce, Tra uh, the Emperor, uh, the uh, statue rather, describes Canidia and Sagana to us. They're old, ugly, haggard. They're disabled, they have wiry, wispy hair. Uh, they have the beard of, the, of a wolf which they bury um, under the ground and they're in the process of making a potion. It becomes a comedy when the statue lets out a giant fart. It's like, brrrr, 
Canadian and Sagan are shocked. One of their wigs falls off, the other's false teeth fall out of their mouth. And of course, because they're witches, they operate under cover of darkness. Now, the darker piece, uh, the second piece is much darker, more sinister. And in this instance, what we have is Canidia and Sagana are pretty much similar. They're still brewing a potion, but there's also a teenage boy in their presence. And if we look at their hair, they're entwined with snakes and in some versions replaced by snakes. And we can see Horus has borrowed from the Greeks with Medusa and the Gorgons who came before him. And of course, the story is one of them wants to marry a rich, handsome man but this won't happen because they're old ugly and haggard so they have to brew a powerful potion where they need to sacrifice the young boy uh, and use his insides particularly his liver to make this powerful love potion and from there we can see the propaganda against women beginning many many years ago now, between the invasion of the Romans, the arrival of Christianity, uh, and of course, uh, the 1400s, witchcraft was believed to be an old pagan tradition around this time, as the pagan tradition started to be forgotten and lost. However, in 1484, Pope Innocent VIII uh, actually paved the way for many European religious groups to begin persecutions, because he denounced witchcraft as heresy. And this happened around 1484, sorry. Uh, so 1484, he denounces heresy. Um, and in England, the persecution of witches didn't formally begin until Henry VIII passed the Witchcraft Act of 1541. While the new law brought about plenty of witch trials, including convictions and acquittals, it wasn't until around 1599 that the witch hunt in London really started um, taking shape. In fact, Anne Boleyn was executed at the tower right next to us and she'd been accused of treason by way of adultery, cheating on Henry VIII. However, she had also been accused of witchcraft and uh, some say Henry thought that she had created a powerful love potion because there was no way he could have fallen in love with her. And he also believed, according to some sources, that she had bewitched his horse uh, and he had an accident on his horse. And this accident meant that Henry was unable to go riding again and especially unable to go jousting again. And soon after the execution of Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII passed his law against witchcraft. Now the Tower of London in front of us over there has a lot of stories connected to witches, witchcraft and magic. And one of my favourite is the legend of the ravens. Do you guys know the legend of the ravens? According to legend, if the ravens ever leave the Tower of London, the tower will fall and the kingdom with it. So the ravens of the tower are very, very important. In fact, legend has it that my favorite king in English history, Charles II, believed this legend so much that he petitioned governments to actually make a statute that said there should never be less than six ravens within the Tower of London. Now it's difficult to pinpoint the exact origins of this legend of the ravens concerning the Tower of London. However, one of my favorite legends connected to the ravens is that of a king called Bran Hen. Now Bran Hen was a Celtic king and he used to fight invaders and defeat them successfully. And he was so good that some people started believing that Bran Hen used magic to defeat um, these um, invaders. However, he was mortally wounded and died. And after his death, he was buried at the White Tower um, in the Tower of London. And it is said they buried him with his head facing where the invaders were coming from. Now, fans of Game of Thrones, this is quite interesting. If you love Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, the creator of Game of Thrones, based a lot of his world on English history and European history as well, of course. Um, but to give an example of what I mean, ravens started coming to the place where Bran Hen was buried and uh, legend has it people thought this was evidence of magic and the reason they thought this may have been evidence of magic was because the word Bran is one of the old Celtic words for raven so when ravens started coming to a place where a guy called Raven was buried people thought it was evidence of magic and that is why Bran in Game of Thrones 
is the three-eyed raven. So next time you're in the Tower of London, thank the ravens. And of course, why not follow the Raven Master on social media? And in fact, the Raven Master uh, gives you updates on how the ravens are doing, so you can kind of know how the nation is doing as well. Now, the Tower of London has a lot of stories connected to witchcraft and magic. And one of my favorites is of a man called Hugh Draper. That's spelled H-E-W. Hugh Draper was accused of the art of divination, predicting the future. He was found guilty of it and imprisoned in the Tower of London. Now, when I say he was imprisoned in the tower, I mean he was imprisoned within the grounds, not the actual tower itself. The actual tower itself is the White Tower, which you can see with the flag flying high over there. Hugh Draper was imprisoned in another tower within the Tower of London, and this tower is known as the Salt Tower. And in fact, if you ever visit the Tower of London, be sure to go inside the Salt Tower because you can see a piece of graffiti an astronomical clock done by Hugh Draper and it still exists to this day. They've protected it with plexiglass so I definitely recommend checking out the Salt Tower. All Hallows by the Tower claims to be the oldest church in the city of London having been built around the year 675. However, before that time, uh, well uh, uh, around that time, the parish of the area used to be known as All Hollows the Less. And when it was the parish of All Hollows the Less, around 1602, we had a woman called Elizabeth Jackson. Now, what you find often with uh, accusations of witchcraft is that most of the time, money is involved in some way, shape or form. And in fact, Elizabeth Jackson was accused by her neighbors who owed her money. And they said that she bewitched their daughter who ballooned to three times her size and went deaf and uh, dumb. She couldn't see or talk. In some cases, say she were, actually went blind as well. Now, Elizabeth was found guilty and arrested and imprisoned. However, many doctors came to her aid and many medical professionals came to her aid and they decided that this young girl in the old parish of All Hallows the Less suffered from something they called wandering womb or hysteria at the time and there was no witchcraft involved whatsoever. Um, so of course, Elizabeth was arrested and imprisoned despite being innocent. And a very sad thing is even though many people believed she was innocent. One of the saddest things about witchcraft accusations around this time, so we're talking 1602, 1603, is that once you were accused, that stigma would remain with you. Once a witch, always a witch. Um, and no one would want to be friends with you or give you work or anything like that. And many women sadly suffered this way. And a, a few of the men who were accused of witchcraft as well. But it is resoundingly more women accused, found guilty of witchcraft and later executed for the crime. Now over here we got a wonderful view of the HMS Belfast, the warship over there and Tower Bridge and it makes for a great photo opportunity and we actually pass here on the, uh, during the witches tour and in fact the HMS Belfast was an important World War II ship. It's got nothing to do with witches but it is a nice segue, a nice lead into World War II because during World War II you had a lot of covens rising up to actually fight the Nazis, to fight the enemy. And in fact, if you've ever watched Indiana Jones, the first one, um, part of that was true. The Nazis were actually looking for magical uh, devices that might aid them during World War II. And in fact, a lot of the top uh, commanders and officers in the Nazi regime actually believed in the esoteric and magic. And as such, in England, we had quite a few Witch, uh, uh, witches and covens rising up to fight the Nazis via magic and one of the most famous was led by a man named Gerald Gardner and Gerald Gardner is considered the father of modern witchcraft, modern Wicca and he went on record to say he attended a ceremony on the coast of England and uh, this ceremony was supposed to be a magical ceremony to stop the Nazis from invading via the sea and he went on record to say I'm not are saying that witchcraft works or that, that the ceremony worked. However, the Nazis never invaded via the sea. And of course, the Nazis actually had plans to invade England via the sea. So it is quite interesting the way Gerald Gardner, the father of modern Wicca, uh, 
coined that phrase that he used. Another fascinating story about World War II and witches actually has nothing to do with the witches. In this instance, it's merely a group of women who were so good at their job. The Nazis called them the Naktex and the Night Witches. And the Night Witches were an elite squadron of women who would fly planes with, uh, uh, with single engines and single propellers under cover of darkness and very little navigational equipment over Nazi-occupied territories and Nazi Germany. And they would drop bombs on the Nazis. And whenever they drop bombs on the Nazis, they never miss. They always hit the mark. And it is actually said that any Nazi soldier who captured a night witch or shot, shot down a night witch plane would be awarded the Iron Cross, which was one of the highest level of medals you could get, kind of like the Croix de Guerre in France or the St. George's Cross here in England. And of course, this was merely a group of women who were just good at their jobs, but for some reason they were called the Night Witches. If you want to find out more about them, the Museum of London had an amazing exhibition on the Night Witches. If you go to whichever search engine you use, just type in Night Witches and it is a very interesting story. These night switches were, of course, from Russia. Now, one of the earliest uh, forms of witchcraft uh, persecution in England actually dates back to long before Henry VIII. Uh, it actually dates back to the 900s and it's declared um, that the Aylesworth widow was accused of witchcraft. Um, now, the story uh, claims that Aethelwald, the bishop, and Wolfstan Usia exchanged lands with the cognizance of King Edgar and his counsellors. The bishop gave Wolfstan the estate of Washington and uh, Wolfstan gave him the estate of Yaxley uh, and at Aylesworth. Now, the story goes on to uh, uh, say that um, Aylesworth had been fortified by a widow, uh, forfeited by a widow and her son because they drove iron pins into, a, uh, into Wolfstan father and it was discovered and the deadly image or murderous instrument was dragged out of her room. Now, this is a form of image magic, uh, which we in the West know as voodoo, but it is so much more um, than that. And uh, the, uh, the woman was taken to London Bridge along with her son to be executed here by London Bridge where we currently are. And it is actually said that the son escaped and became a highwayman. However, the woman was eventually executed here by London Bridge and this was around the 970s just before 975 and this is one of the earliest records we have of someone being executed and tried are uh, tried and executed for the crime of witchcraft now the law surrounding witchcraft is a very long and complicated and also convoluted law and it's very very difficult to pinpoint certain things. However, as we mentioned, Henry VIII created one of the first statutes or laws around witchcraft. Now his laws were strengthened by Elizabeth I, his daughter, and Elizabeth I was a very interesting character um, and she's one of the most fascinating characters in English history and in fact she he strengthened her father's laws against witchcraft to make it a crime punishable by death. However, during her reign, a group of women were accused of image magic, which we just touched on earlier. Now, as I mentioned, in the West, we think of image magic as voodoo, but it is in fact just a tiny part of voodoo. Voodoo is a religion in and of itself, and voodoo um, we get zombies, the legend of zombies from voodoo, as well as image magic. We think image magic is when you get a doll and stick needles into the doll um, to try and injure someone. Now, these women were accused of making candles in the shape of Queen Elizabeth I and certain members of her court. It was then said they put these candles in a pile of dung because dung, of course, has methane and methane makes things hot. And the idea was, as the dung got hotter and hotter, the candle wax would melt even more. And as it melted, what would happen is the queen would fall ill, and so would the members of her court 
who had candles made in their images. These women were arrested and imprisoned at the tower and later executed elsewhere. Now, a fascinating thing is that this period, we also have a story that says Elizabeth hired a man called Dr. John Dee. And Dr. John Dee is actually considered to be one of the fathers of the British Empire. Um, and Dr. John Dee, we don't learn much about him in school because sadly, by the time he died, he was suffering from mental health issues. And it is said by the time he died, um, he was working on a device to communicate with the angels in heaven. But Dr. John Dee was a practitioner of the magical arts, a witch of sorts. And Dr. John Dee was hired by Queen Elizabeth I to actually perform counter magic and read her horoscope as well. Um, now, it's very interesting that Elizabeth I would hire her own witch to protect her and perform magic because she'd strengthened her father's laws, in some cases making witchcraft a crime punishable by death. Now, an interesting part of Dr. John Dee's story is, as I mentioned, he's considered by some to be one of the fathers or the father of the British Empire. The British Empire, as we know it in history, begins pretty much with Elizabeth I. And of course, you can argue it had its beginnings before that, but it is quite a fascinating thing. And uh, uh, John Dee, Dr. John Dee rather, actually did something quite interesting. He would create propaganda for the Queen. And in this propaganda, he would present himself as Merlin and he would present Queen Elizabeth I as Arthur which is a very powerful story of course and it's quite a fascinating thing and this would help to build what we would eventually know as the British Empire and in fact if you ever come to the tour which is tour the walking tour you will walk past this wonderful mosaic giving us the history of London the last 2000 years and you'll find this little bit which is quite interesting because the mythical King Arthur may have been inspired by a Briton resisting the Saxon raids and of course Dr John Dee used that to strengthen Elizabeth I's story and he is quite a fascinating individual. Um, he's featured in a book called A Discovery of Witches, which the BBC recently made into a TV show. I quite like the second season of A Discovery of Witches, but I have not yet read the books themselves. And as we get closer and closer to Halloween, the sun begins to set earlier and earlier. And as we walk over Millennium Bridge, we get our first glimpse of St Paul's Cathedral where the tour ends. The Millennium Bridge has some wonderful views as we can see over here. Millennium Bridge and this wonderful sunset view is the site of another notorious witchcraft story. A woman lived close to Millennium Bridge and she was accused of witchcraft by one of her neighbours. The woman in question was called Sarah Mordyke and Sarah Mordyke was accused of witchcraft by a man named Richard Hathaway. Richard Hathaway would go into fits much like he suffered from epilepsy and that he would bend over double he was quite flexible, much like a circus performer um, or one of those artists who are very, very flexible. Um, and of course, on top of this, he would vomit profusely. And when he vomited, he claimed, uh, they actually found rather, they found pins and needles in his vomit. And he claimed that uh, Sarah Mordyke, who lived somewhere close to the Millennium Bridge on this side of the river that we're, uh, we're talking about. The building has since been destroyed but it was somewhere on this side of the river by the Millennium Bridge and he claimed that Sarah had bewitched him in this manner. Now kind of luckily for Sarah a doctor, a man named Dr Martin came to her aid and Dr Martin 
did something very, very interesting. What Dr. Martin um, did was he decided to perform a test to see if she was a witch or not. And uh, one of the ways you could break a spell was to bleed a witch. So if someone had cast a spell against you, if you cut them and they bled, that meant the spell would be broken. Dr. Martin caught someone who looked like Sarah Mordyke, had her put on Sarah Mordyke's clothes, and then he put her in a dimly lit room. He then said to Hathaway, there's the witch that got you, the witch that bewitched you. And then he said to Hathaway, if you bleed her, the spell would be broken. Hathaway cut the woman and she bled a little bit and the spell was broken. Dr. Martin reveals that it was not in fact Sarah Mordyke. So Hathaway was arrested, but in prison he started saying that he was being bewitched by Sarah Mordyke once again. Uh, and in fact that the spell had gotten much stronger. In fact, he said it could no longer eat. However, people started watching him secretly and when he thought he was alone in the middle of the night, they saw him eating food he had hidden away and in some cases they saw him swallowing the pins and needles that he would later vomit in an effort to prove that Sarah Mordyke had actually been a witch. And of course, Sarah luckily was released. But once again, like the case of Elizabeth Jackson, once you were accused of witchcraft, you would always be a witch. That stigma would remain with you for the rest of your life. Now, information about witches could be found all over the place. There were verses about it in the Bible, and we go into a bit more detail on that during the witches' tour. But also, after Elizabeth I died in 1603, her successor was James, who became James VI of Scotland and James I of England. And James was a notorious witch hunter. In Scotland, he had killed somewhere between 1,500 um, people and 4,000 people for the crime of witchcraft. Of course, he hadn't killed him, uh, them himself, uh, but his laws about witchcraft had led to their executions and in fact he had re written a book about witchcraft this book's name was the demonology which is basically the study of demons the demonology would tell you many things about witches and the art of witchcraft however on top of this once in England, James started paying for pamphlets, much like the pamphlets I mentioned in the case um, of Sarah Mordyke, who lived somewhere next to the Millennium Bridge. And these pamphlets would tell you how to spot a witch, catch a witch, and kill a witch. And around this time, we're talking the 1600s, James is king from around 1603 to about 1625. And around this time, many poor people cannot read. So a lot of these pamphlets and the Bible verses of which James added to his own new Bible, which, which would become known as the King James Version of the Bible. And it's believed that he added a line that goes something like, never suffer a poisoner to live. And that line was eventually changed to become never suffer a witch to live. And verses like this would be read in churches and cathedrals in places like St. Paul's Cathedral, and they'd be read while people found guilty of witchcraft would be punished in the churchyard. And are the people who'd read them were the clergy, the priests and the brothers, etc., in the church, because they were some of the only people who could read. The commoners could not read. So what the clergy would do is read from the demonology by James I and the pamphlets and James would actually pay for these pamphlets to be printed out of his own pocket. So they'd be telling people how to catch a witch and kill a witch and spot a witch. And of course, like the story of Sarah Mordyke, they tell you how to break a spell, for example, by bleeding a witch. And many a witch was punished in the churches of London and England. Uh, that we are looking at, much like St. Paul's Cathedral over here, which is a very, very beautiful building. An interesting thing about St. Paul's Cathedral is that Sir Christopher Wren, who designed it, worked with a man called Sir Nicholas Hawksmoor. And Sir Nicholas Hawksmoor designed many churches in the city of London. And in fact, five of his churches 
form a pentagram that goes around the city of London and in the center of this pentagram we do have Sir Christopher Wren's marvelous St. Paul's Cathedral. Now to take it back to James I briefly who we talk a lot more about on the tour um, he did so many despicable things that resulted in the deaths of quite a few women and in fact if any of you have heard, have heard of the Pendle Witches or the Pendle Witch Hunts and the Pendle Witch Trials those happened during the reign of James I and James I had a direct hand in the execution of these unfortunate women. Our final story concerns this building over here. This building is known as Bracken House and it's named after that man over there. The statue you see is of one Brendan Bracken and Brendan Bracken was the saviour of the Financial Times. Bracken House is where you will find the offices of the Financial Times newspaper. Bracken was fascinated by the occult and he was actually involved and closely connected with many people who had occult interests or who were into the occult. For example, Brendan Bracken worked closely during World War II. He was Churchill's Minister of Information or Minister of uh, Propaganda. And he basically was the boss of MI8, uh, which were the inter uh, sort of the information spies. And he worked closely with a man called um, Lord Evan Morgan, the Viscount Tradegar. And Evan Morgan, was a fascinating individual. He believed and practiced the dark arts and he is actually the only person, allegedly, who Alistair Crowley was afraid of. Um, and of course, Alistair Crowley is another powerful figure in magical circles. Um, and because he was the only person Crowley was afraid of, this is quite a fascinating thing. And it's said that Evan Morgan once cast a spell against his commanding officer because his commanding officer wanted to have him um, put on uh, under court-martial uh, for some failings that he had done and one of the, uh, the most interesting things is that this commanding officer who had a spell cast against him died under mysterious circumstances a few days after the spell had been cast against him and of course Evan Morgan worked with Brendan Bracken who this building that we're walking around is named after and Bracken was very closely associated with Winston Churchill and in fact they were good friends there were actually some rumors that Bracken was Winston Churchill's illegitimate son now these rumors were not true at all but they were quite interesting and in fact Bracken was said to be the only person who could bring Winston Churchill out of his depressive moods because Churchill did have a darker side and he did suffer uh, from depressive moods from time to time and in fact he used to call it his black dog. Do look up Churchill's black dog it's a very very interesting look into mental health issues and depression in particular. Now Bracken was said to be the only individual who could bring or one of the only individuals at any rate who could bring Winston Churchill the great Prime Minister out of his depressive dark mood um, and of course Bracken would grow to be a famous individual who uh, helped to save the Financial Times and is considered the father or founder of the modern Financial Times that we have today. Those of you who have read 1984 by George Orwell may find something quite interesting because the initials of Big Brother are BB Brendan Bracken and of course the protagonist is Winston and this is a slight nod from George Orwell to the connection between Winston Churchill and Brendan Bracken and of course this gives us an idea of a connection between Winston Churchill and the occult and if you come to the front doors of Bracken House you will find a very very interesting image indeed that is an astronomical clock which is one of the devices you use to aid in the art of divination and several other things. And in fact, you can see the signs of the zodiac over there. I'm a Scorpio, so I always point Scorpio out. But if you look closely, displayed as the sun god is the face of Winston Churchill. And in fact, the Financial Times have an amazing article that you can look up on their online archives. And it talks about the connection between Churchill and Brendan Bracken. They don't talk at all about the occult connections, but it is quite fascinating. And it does tell us one of the reasons why Churchill's face 
is on this astronomical clock and it's quite fascinating because Churchill is depicted as the sun god which is one of the most powerful pagan figures uh, in a lot of the pagan religions, the old religions and of course in magic, wicca and witchcraft. I hope you've enjoyed this little tour, uh, this introduction tour to witchcraft. Do check out our witches tour if you ever have the opportunity. It ends right here by Bracken House where you can come to get your very own photo of Winston Churchill on an astronomical clock and you get these amazing views of St Paul's Cathedral. And of course on the witches tour we talk a lot more about many other different people accused of witchcraft um, and of course we go into the details of how the propaganda worked against women. I do hope you've enjoyed this little uh, video. I've been Vincent and remember check out our, uh, our witches tour and have a lovely rest of your morning, afternoon, evening etc wherever you are. Bye!